Hi, HR Nation, and welcome back to another episode of the HR Leaders Podcast, the show where we explore the future of work with industry experts and HR executives from the world's leading global brands. Today, we have a special guest on the show. We're joined by Mark Hirschberg, author of the Career Toolkit, Essential Skills for Success That No One Taught You. Welcome to the show. How are you? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me today. Nice to nice to see you. I love the background. I get to see into someone else's world today. <laughs> uh, Thank you. Yeah. It looks way I too clean to and organized, up. though. My, my, my mine's a mess. I had to set this up once I was stuck at home. <laughs> this was not my standard background, but as I started a new video, I realized I needed to upgrade a bit. Yeah. Have you heard about this new trend where people are like renting books to put on their shelves? Have you heard about that one? No, I haven't come across that. There's a whole industry now where you can basically rent a book to make yourself kind of look smart and put them on your background at home. It's a whole industry. It's crazy. So you've got all these uh, books that people put on their shelves and they rent them out and they change it around. I'm like, wow, like that's that's a whole nother level <laughs> of dedication. Well, I'm lucky. Everything I have on my bookshelf was something in my apartment <laughs> when I said, "Okay, I need to, I need to put together a bookshelf as a background." Uh, yeah, I didn't have to go out and rent anything. <laughs> yeah, the same as mine. I just literally took things. Even my employees, I was like, "If you have anything at home that you're just laying around that you don't really care about, just put it on the shelf in the set in the office, and we'll, we'll, we'll use that." And now it's kind of looked like a. If anyone who can see it, by the way, for those of you who can't see it, it's pretty crazy. We've got Star Wars, we've got Marvel, we've got you know, best-selling books. We've got all sorts of weird and wonderful things. And uh, I love the giant giant light bulb you have behind you. That's pretty cool. Thank you. That was uh, from an award event I went to. And they had these giant light bulbs. I thought, this is, this is great, right? This symbolizes <laughs> innovation. Yeah. I know I need a giant light bulb at home. <laughs> I didn't know why yet, but I wanted it. Yeah. The light bulb is like the, the, the poster child of innovation, isn't it? Like the, if you think of innovation, everyone has a light bulb logo or, or it's, it is the go-to. <laughs> exactly. So I, I clearly <laughs> needed one. Look, um, that, that was a, such a random start to an episode, but I love it. Well, t tell everyone, Mark, a little bit more about yourself and uh, your journey and background to, to where we are now with the recent launch of the book. Sure. My background began in a fairly standard way. I came out of MIT with a couple degrees during the dot-com era. And I began a path as a software developer. But early in my career, I knew I wanted to move into management. I found those problems much more interesting. I also realized to become a CTO, it wasn't just about being the best software developer. I needed to learn these other skills. I needed to learn leadership, how to do a budget, how to hire people, how to work with others. But no one ever taught me this. And so I set out on my own journey to start to develop these skills. I, as I developed them, I quickly moved up and became a CTO, which I've been doing now for 20 some years. But along the way, as I began to hire people, I started to ask it during the interviews, I'd ask them a technical question and I'd get a technical answer, whether it's marketing, accounting, whatever, they knew their domain. But then I would ask a question, what makes a good teammate? What do you look for in a leader? And I'd get blank stares <laughs> because no one really thinks about this. And the only reason I did was I set out to say, I have to develop this in myself. So I realized there was a real shortage of these skills. I began putting together a program to train up my team. Around the same time, MIT was also discovering this shortfall. And in fact, research that we've gotten at MIT that's been uh, feedback given to other schools as well from corporate America has said, corporate America wants to see people who are good leaders teammates, good communication, negotiation, networking, things your audience, I'm sure, understands because <laughs> yeah, people yeah. Tell us this. And so it's not just obviously MIT, it's not just college students, but there's this real shortfall. And as MIT put together this program, I said, well, I've been working on it. Can I help? I said, yes, please. We'd love to get the experience of a practitioner. So I helped develop the course. I've been teaching there now for the past 20 years because they invited me. I said, you know, you're bringing a different perspective. So myself and other people help teach it. And after doing this for two decades, I know the power of these skills and how we can teach them effectively. I've seen how they work at MIT. I've also seen in the mentoring that I've done for other people on my teams, in other work that I've done, both nonprofit and teaching other universities, the impact this has had. I said, you know what? It, we have to take this and expand it beyond just that MIT class. So I put it into a book and an app. 
What was the uh, modules that you came up with uh, at my MIT? Could you? I'm not going to go through the entire thing, but how did you break it down? How long? How long was the course? What did you kind of break it down in terms of the modules? It's a year long program, and in doing so, we have a couple things in the in the spring and fall. But the heart of it is really a boot camp right in the center, a week-long intensive training program. And the modules are relatively short. They're just a few hours each. Because one of the hardest things when teaching this is getting people to recognize the value, right? And we all kind of get like, oh, leadership, it's good. And I know I should be a leader, but it's understanding the importance of leadership and the subtlety for any of these skills. So what we typically do is we give the students in, in the class where we're a lot more interactive, we give them a role-playing module, we give them a case study, we give them something interactive, and we tell them typically as a group to go try and solve it. And in doing so, they will often fail. And they fail because they are approaching it as a, uh, in an analytical way, right? In the typical MIT way, <laughs> right? Let's try just throwing numbers at. And in fact, there's some subtlety to this. So for example, we use the, um, Carson Racing Challenge. So Carson Racing, that's a famous uh, space shuttle Challenger case study that was, I think, developed at HBS. And so you're taking the concept of the, the Challenger where there's that risk of failure and you put it in, in terms of a race car so you don't realize it's the Challenger. One of the things they have to do is learn to ask for more data, right? Because if you think about how we train people in school, you know exactly what formula to use to solve the problem set. It's what your professor taught you this past week. <laughs> you don't have to go and ask, do I have all the information I need? But in the real world, your boss never says, here's everything you need, do it. Learning to ask, learning to say, is there another way to look at this is an important skill that we don't teach. So when they go in with their mentality of, okay, well, they're giving me everything I need, let's just solve it. They tend to fail because they haven't learned that skill about asking. Mm. that's an interesting one isn't it and uh, that's something that i i can certainly relate to for going from school to the business world you do a, you do approach it that you've given they've given you all of the uh, formulas <laughs> to get there and, and it takes a long while to be like actually is this everything <laughs> that i need or you learn along the way or you fail forward and you and you, and you learn to ask and be vulnerable and and it's okay not to have all the answers all the time in another module we do this is one on communications. And so in this one, what we do is we recognize here, MIT students, we're all good at communicating technical knowledge to other technical people, but not everyone in the world is technical. And unfortunately being at MIT or being in an engineering department in any school, you are completely used to other technical people around you. Even within our engineering teams, you're used to other technical people. Within your sales teams, you're used to other salespeople, right? Marketing people hang out with marketing people. And so recognizing different people communicate different ways. So in this one uh, module, what we do is we take students and we say, here's a situation you're going to have to explain. But now imagine explaining to, and we give them basically some personality types. And we say, take the extreme version of this, right? Take like the extremely analytical person. Take that kind of space cadet head in the clouds where they're <laughs> seeing that big picture, but they can't deal with the details. Think about that very detailed person. Think about these different types of people. How would you pitch to these different people? And in doing so, they suddenly realize, wow, it, it's different. I would actually speak differently to them. And I've had students who have come back and said, yeah, I, over the summer, you know, I was in this meeting and I saw like these people were really like this and these people like that. I recognize they're different in how they think. And I have to communicate differently to them. Yeah. So the, the key to these modules, it's not, we can't, you could spend semesters teaching all this. It's getting that mindset shift. It's saying, hey, you know what? We don't all communicate the same way. You know what? We don't always give you the information. And when they get that aha moment, that light bulb, <laughs> that's where they start their journey onto growing and expanding their skill set. Mm -hmm. So we, we spoke a bit about that, but when you wrote this book, who did you have in mind? Who is, who, who is, give, give us, give us the it, overview. It is a broad set. So it's certainly not just for engineers and it's not just for college students because I have seen people not just in their twenties and thirties, but forties, fifties, even sixties who have said, wow, I haven't had these skills. One thing that always shocks me, I have a chapter on interviewing. Now we've all 
seen lots of content on interviewing. We all know how do you answer this hard question, but almost no one addresses how to hire someone, how to interview from the other side of the table. I've met C-suite executives who have said, yeah, I've never had interview training. But we all say, especially for white collar types of jobs, you know, the team is so important. People are the asset, hiring the right people. Why are we putting no effort into <laughs> teaching people how to do this correctly? Yeah, I never got training, by the way. My training was, and I'm sure like 99% of people was just sitting in on interviews as I was a junior manager. And just by sitting in, that was supposed to be my training, you know, listening to my manager hire and just sitting there taking notes. Like that was my extent of my training. <laughs> and that's it for most people. And sometimes you get lucky and sometimes you don't, right? Imagine if we said to our chefs, hey, how do you learn to be a chef? Well, you learn from your parents and maybe you happen to have parents who are great cooks. Maybe you have parents who weren't great and you're just going to say, well, you know, some, some got lucky, some didn't. We say, no, we're going to send them off to the Cordon Bleu or some other great school so they can learn to cook. Let's not hope they just got the right experience. Let's train them. And we have to do that with our hiring. Mm -hmm. What's the biggest mistakes you see people make when hiring? I would say people don't understand cultural fit correctly. And cultural fit is this thing that I think really gets abused and misused because people talk about, okay, our culture, it's these six values that we have posted on the wall that we have written down the website, right? These are our values. Oh, do we have someone who, you know, takes initiative, right? Or whatever your values are. And, you know, companies, they have the, the written values and then they have the actual values. And even more important than if they fit into those values is typically how people communicate and engage with each other. I would argue that the communication styles are a more important component of our culture than anything we write up there. So here's a, a really simple example. Imagine a company where people like to have open debate. Right, where And this is what, what I personally like, is let's go into the meeting and someone puts up an idea and someone else says, hey, I disagree. Here's a better idea. Here's why your idea won't work. Right, And you have that kind of back and forth, never personal, never against the person, but like we'll tear down ideas. In fact, when I hire people, I specifically look for people who are going to tear down my ideas. That's something I value very much. And that's, that's a great culture. Now, there's another great type of culture in which you don't do that in which all your decisions are made not in the meeting, but beforehand. If we're gonna be in a meeting, I don't challenge your idea in the meeting, I go to you ahead of time and say, hey, what are you thinking? Okay, let's talk about your idea. Why well, I was thinking this, let's resolve it. And we resolve it privately. And we have these individual conversations with others. And then when we go into the meeting, okay, now we all have reached an agreement and now we just kind of finalize it. And that can be a great culture too. Both of them are good, but someone who is very much in one culture is going to be terrible in the other, right? The person from the first going to the second, everyone's thinking, okay, we're in this meeting and now we just kind of rubber stamp it because we've made the decision. This person says, wait, this is wrong, right? And now this person seems like a disruptor, but he'd be great in that first culture. And in that first culture, so I'm from the second culture, they're not going to be ready to kind of battle ideas and they're going to feel like they're not making a contribution. They're going to be seen as not as engaged. So it really depends, I think, communication style. And this is just one, one aspect of a larger set of communication styles. Mm -hmm. I think that's far more important than what we call cultural fit. So would you then um, ask questions, frame questions around that during the interview to understand what type of person and what perhaps other companies have worked in and how that culture was? Absolutely. In fact, this goes to another common mistake, which is if you look at most job descriptions, they are poorly written and they miss a lot of important things. So let's take a director of marketing. You say, okay, director of marketing, your job is support sales, run social media, do events, generate leads. Like, yeah, okay, this is all standard stuff. I mm. could have guessed most of this <laughs> yeah. from, from the title. But what's important is first, are you spending your time doing lead generation? Is that 70% of your time or 10% of your time? is event marketing more or less of the time, right? And we don't say this in the job description. And there's 
arguments about why you should say it or not in a public description, but internally you better be clear. Is it important to get someone who is you know, really good at lead generation and just okay at events, or is it the opposite, right? And then when we say, well, leadership, what kills me, so many job descriptions, they say strong leadership and communication skills. This, right? so, this is like some- It's so generic. <laughs> yeah. I, I admit early on in my career, I used to say that because I saw everyone else like, okay, right, leadership, communication. Well, what does that mean, right? We just talked about communication. Does communication mean strong communication with people within your own team? Does it mean communicating with different departments? Does it mean external communication? Does it mean written? Does it mean oral? Are they all equal? When you say leadership, what does that mean? Is, are you looking for someone we need to take a demoralized team and really change it? Do you need someone who's a transformational leader? Do you just need someone who's a good leader because you have a lot of strong personalities and someone needs to be able to kind of keep everyone together? These are different types of leadership. They're all valid, but when you're hiring, the problem is you might be looking for a transformational leader I might be looking for a leader who's just good at corralling the cats. And now we're evaluating people differently. We need to have that discussion. We need to get more detailed, not just on the technical skills and experience, not just on six years of this and knowledge of that, but on these other skills, soft skills, power skills, firm skills, whatever you want to call them, what these are and how we're going to evaluate. Mm. What would you say to the people then that say, Mark, um, we don't put those in a job description because we find that out information out during the interview process. You need to put it in your internal job description. You need everyone on the hiring team to be very clear on, we are looking for a transformational leader. We are looking for someone who communicates well to our customers, particularly in this way. You don't have to put it in the external job description, but internally, if you're not saying that to the team, if everyone on the hiring team isn't absolutely clear, you're going to be hiring, looking for things and going in different directions. And that's going to lead to inferior candidates. Mm -hmm. I want to ask you this question because I'm sure you've got some good examples based on your career experience. So I think we all have. <laughs> what are some commonly asked questions, the bad interview questions <laughs> that you hear people ask? Brain teasers, I love brain teasers, but people don't understand brain teasers. So a good brain teaser, and I, I give this example in the book, this might be uh, a Feynman number, right? Ping pong balls in the 747, because that's the type of thing you can think through and calculate and say, well, okay, um, how big is the 747? I don't know, 300 feet. And it's okay that's not actually 300 feet, but you know, you know it's not 3,000 feet, you know it's not 30 feet. And you can see, are they thinking about this the right way? Do they think about, oh, you know, as we do like 300 feet by, let's say 10 by 10. Oh, but wait, there are chairs. So are the chairs in or out? How do we take that into account? So you can see how people start to just kind of calculate. Sorry, what's that question? <laughs> so I didn't, I'm, you, oh, I'm you missed sorry. This is, <laughs> yeah. uh, this is How many ping pong balls fit in a 747? Oh, okay, okay, sorry. I just missed that bit. <laughs> okay, I like, okay. No, I, I brushed over it because I'm, I'm so used to hearing questions like this. Oh, okay, I've never heard that one before, okay. <laughs> These are called Feynman numbers. These oh, are right. just, do some type of back of the envelope calculation. How many turkeys do Americans eat on Thanksgiving? Right, where you just have to take some known numbers and do some back of the envelope estimations. And that, that's fine. There are some other ones I like as well, but here are the bad ones. The classic, why are manhole covers round? Right, this is a famous Someone one. Someone asked that? Oh, oh God, oh, wow. Supposedly Microsoft was asking it in the, in the 90s. And the <laughs> answer, there's, there's two acceptable answers to this. One is they're heavy. And so you can roll it on the ground, right? If they're square, you can't roll it, you have to carry it. So round, you can roll it and not have to lift it. And the other is because they're heavy, if it's round, it's not gonna accidentally fall through when you take it out, it can't fall through uh, the open hole. If it's a square, for example, you can imagine you, you have the square vertical and there's an angle in which it just drops through the hole and hurts the one below. Mm. But here's the problem with that question. Either you get it or you don't. Right, either that light bulb goes on or it doesn't. You go, oh, I know, round, you're not gonna be able to fall through because your diameter is constant. That wasn't my first thought, by the way. <laughs> what, what was your thought? <laughs> my, my first thought was that it would fit at any angle you put it in. So if you wanna take the amount of cover off, when you put it back, if it's a square, you have to perfectly line up the edges. 
Whereas with a manhole cover, you put it on and it just it fits at every point because it's round. So you that's another good point. That, that, so, anyways, but, but you either get that or you don't. Right? It either occurs to you in the moment or it doesn't. There's no partial credit. And what we're not looking for is can you come up with the right idea at the right time? Because we know all of us can't always at the right time get the right idea. Right? Mm-hmm. No one can. What we're trying to see is can you think, right? Can you think through this? And so when you have a brain teaser where you have steps, you have a process and people can think through it, you can watch. And it's not about whether they get the right answer. It's about what is their thinking process. Mm -hmm. And those are the good brain teasers. But unfortunately, people don't distinguish between the two of them. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I nev- I've never heard either of those before, which is I don't know if it's a good or a bad thing. <laughs> uh, what well, you mentioned uh, one of them, but what are your other favorite ones? You know, if, if for, for for all of the leaders and HR executives and everyone listening, what are your favorite questions to ask during the interview process? My favorite question is actually the one I start with: "Tell me about yourself," mm-hmm. and it's incredibly broad and generic. And let me see how do people talk about themselves you can go so many different directions of that personally yeah. professionally you can go some you know you can, you can go a lot a lot of areas and that that tells you something when someone often they'll they'll do their professional and they might throw in a little personal and okay that that's good it gives me a little co- color sometimes people spend half the time talking about their personal life thinking hmm and it not in a relevant way thinking okay you're not good at understanding context right? How are they telling this? Are they telling it in a chronological order? Are they telling a story? Are they tying it into what the objectives are or what their criteria are for the role? How they answer it. It's not just what their answer is. It's not just I was at this job or I did this, but how they tie it all together. That tells me so much about them. And so looking at these meta answers, looking at not just what they're saying, but how they're saying it, that's actually extremely informative. Mm-hmm. A big, a big uh, focus for our audience and for for every organization, to be honest, is is the different types of diversity in hiring. You know, why is this important? Because I know you you talk a lot about this, and uh, let's just start there. Why is it important, and and then how how do we do this? Sure. And I touch briefly on traditional diversity, and then I go into a different type. Now, diversity in general, obviously, it's important, and I think your audience probably understands this because we are not all white males, right? And if we have a room full of white males, suddenly we don't get the perspective of people of different races, religions, ethnic backgrounds, capabilities. We've seen time and again problems. So for example, facial recognition or the automatic water faucets, neither of which work as well on African-Americans. And it's because most of the people working on this are white people. We think, oh, you know, I'm going to test on myself. Okay, hey, look, this works, right? I can put my hand under it. It recognizes it, turn the water on. And we don't take into account all the other people, right? And so by having that diversity on your team, you get different perspectives. And while you can't have every possible perspective on a small team, even just having a little extra can make you so much stronger. I use the analogy of steel. If you take iron, iron is very soft. But if you put in just a little bit of carbon, just a tiny amount, 1% carbon, you're no longer pure iron and suddenly you get steel, which is so much stronger. So sometimes we don't want homogeneity. We actually want that diversity. But there's another type of diversity and I, I bring it up as mental diversity. Now a common emerging term is neurodiversity. Mm-hmm. And this is where we talk about people who might be ADHD or someone who might be very far along the autism spectrum, we certainly see within very quant jobs, we get people who might not have great EQ and people skills, but they are savants when it comes to technical skills. And we're starting to say, wow, that's that's valuable. I bring up neurodiversity as a, as a version of that. And this goes back to that communication, is recognizing how people think differently, how they communicate differently. I have a whole chapter or a section within the communication chapter on our thinking modes. I think a certain way because of how I've been trained and you probably think differently because of your experience and training. Both of us together are going to approach a problem in a very different way and that's going to 
deliver more value to the company that we're not all thinking the same way. Mm -hmm. So in the book, do you uh, help um, leaders identify those different types during the interviewing process? Because that, that could, because I, I, when, I, during my interviews, normally I can um, see different personality types and, and then and that, that may change the way I conduct the interview or d direct it. Um, as all, or some particular questions I ask um, as well, because many managers perhaps don't have the experience to lead um, someone, for example, with ADHD, although they're very brilliant, they don't actually understand how to interact or have some of those other softer skills. During the interview uh, or in the interview chapter, I break down different types of questions. And if you use the questions about communication style and questions about values, you can start to uncover how are people perceiving differences in mental diversity mm -hmm. and how are they relating to those? And that's going to start to clue you into how they might be able to handle such a situation. Mm -hmm. Yeah. What about um, a big part of the book is obviously around leadership and management. Um, it seems like every other day there's a new book coming out <laughs> around leadership. I know I get a lot of inquiries and a lot of incredible people on the show. Um, how do you define leadership? Yeah. One thing about this book, because I cover all these different skills, networking, negotiating, <laughs> yeah. leadership, interviewing, I can't get very deep. And to your point, there are entire books on this. It goes back to what we've learned from teaching this class, which is I'm not going to teach you everything about any of these topics. Mm -hmm. But what I'm going to do is get you that mental shift, help you understand, just as we saw earlier that oh, not everyone thinks the same way, or it's not that I have all the information immediately. When you get the mental shift of, you know, maybe I need to go see if there's more information, then you start to see that in everyday examples. And as you go and do it, you start to say, yeah, this is going to be a regular habit. So when it comes to leadership and management, I'm going for that really fundamental, what is the essence of it? And with leadership, there are two inherent problems that I've seen time and again. First is that people, especially junior people, think of leadership positionally. Leaders are people with a title director, VP, C-level, and I will be a leader once I get that title. Yeah. And so it's disabusing them with the notion of it is your position. And we focus on influential leadership. So my definition of leadership is you have a vision for the future. You have some change you want to bring about, and then it's influential in nature. And once students and young professionals recognize this, typically older folks have figured this out, but once young professionals figure this out, they say, okay, I now realize I can lead from anywhere in the table. I can be the most junior person and stepping up and putting forth an idea. So it's understanding that the other side of the coin, the other problem is people unfortunately confuse certain behaviors with leadership. And I have a section called uh, the myth of the alpha male, because unfortunately too many people see that classic behavioral style. And I, I use the analogy of think like any movie from the 1950s or 60s, right? Mm -hmm. There's a guy yeah. in charge and the guy is, you know, hard boiled and, you know, he makes decisions, he's commanding. And this is what we think of as leaders. That's what Hollywood taught us leaders were like back throughout the 20th century. And so we grew up with this imagery in our culture and unfortunately, all too often we see people who engage in those behaviors and say, oh, well, they must be a leader, right? Because there's a correlation. And helping students and helping young professionals recognize and even actually uh, experienced leaders recognize that you don't necessarily have to undertake these behaviors. Leadership is about influence. And once you do that, you don't have to be, damn it, we're doing this. You can be, hey, you know what? Let's consider this. Let's take in all ideas and you can lead that way. And so as a leader, you can be more open and flexible in your style. And as a follower, you can recognize leadership in people who don't necessarily follow that traditional, uh, very kind of narrow definition of leadership behavior. Mm -hmm. And what it means to be a leader has massively shifted, haven't it, over the last few years. Now we talk about leading with empathy. Right. And something we wouldn't have said, <laughs> well, especially, you know, 10 years ago, uh, I had those traditional managers that you're describing <laughs> um, as well. And I, not once did they you know, sit me down and say, Chris, how are you feeling? 
you know, how, how are you? And and that, and now we're seeing uh, many leaders now become more vulnerable. Um, kind of the walls have come down. We're literally seeing into their homes <laughs> for yeah. Zoom and meetings as well, and they're very much leading with empathy. So it's been a big shift, right? Well, there's a great example that in that old school leadership, thinking about when I grew up in the 80s, my understanding of a leader, leaders don't cry. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> That's not what a leader Don't show weakness. Is. Yeah. Right? And then I believe Joe Biden was crying just the other week when he commemorated the unfortunate passing of half a million Americans due to COVID. And he said, look, I'm a leader and I care and I'm expressing emotion. And we do now accept that as leadership. We've expanded our definition. But I think it's important that we continue to do that because it's even if consciously we're saying, oh, that that happens now, there might still be some unconscious biases into what we look for as appropriate or inappropriate for a leader. And we have to have more conscious discussions about to further shift our view about what leaders can and should do. Mm. What are some of the practical things we could do to practice leadership? Great question. For all of these skills, there is an important way in terms of how we have to develop them in people. And it is not what we're used to doing. Most of our education and training has been in a broadcast method. It is someone standing up, the professor standing at the front and saying, hey, everyone, do this, this, this. If you do these three things, you understand accounting. I'm going to now teach you how to do Excel macros in some corporate training workshop. And it is a conveyance of information. And that is perfectly acceptable. If you're trying to learn how to get better at Excel, great. Someone's going to teach you, here's how to do pivot tables or whatever. And you just have to sit there and absorb it, right? Write it down and you're done. The other thing about how that's done, it's usually done just in time, right? So if we're rolling out a new accounting system next month, this month, we're all going to be taught, here's a new accounting system. You're like, okay, great. I'm going to learn. Here are the commands. Okay. And when do I use it? Oh, starting, you know, first Monday of the next month. So it's very clear what the knowledge is and when to apply it. This is very different from leadership or networking or teamwork or communication for two reasons. One, we don't teach someone and say, here's leadership. Oh, and you're going to use it next Tuesday at 2.17 PM. <laughs> if you don't have that obviousness of when it applies. And two, you can't say, do this and you're a leader. There's no three-step process and now you're a leader. There's no, here's the universal formula for communication. So we have to approach it differently. And having an expert alone just say, do this and you're better is not sufficient. The way to teach this, it's the way we teach at MIT, because I'm not at MIT just lecturing all week long. It's also the way business schools have done this for decades. It is a peer learning group. And what you want to do is create groups of people, ideally with different backgrounds, coming from different parts of the company. And you say, let's talk about a communication issue or a leadership issue. You can do a case study. You can take a great podcast like this one as your content. You can use books like mine or other books. You can do any type of content or article, bring it in and say, let's all discuss this. And as we sit around and I say, Chris, how would you have approached this leadership challenge? He says, well, I'd, I'd do it this way. Say, oh, that's interesting. I never would have thought of that. Okay, I would have done it a different way, but that's helpful. And either I can start to incorporate how you might approach it, or if I say, you know, I'm not very comfortable with that, I like my style, but still I'm gonna now recognize, oh, that leader, he's using Chris's style. Oh, this person I'm communicating with, I realize it's not working well because she's she's more like Chris. Okay, I have to think more like Chris does to communicate with her. So by having this discussion, you're getting multiple perspectives and you're creating a richer understanding in your team. You also, by doing this on a regular cadence, not just go once, I now bless you as a leader. Or wait until there's an issue. Don't right. just wait until it is an issue. <laughs> if you have these small groups meeting, let's say once a month, twice a month, now it's a regular cadence. And so at 2.17 PM, someone doesn't have to remember back to three months ago. They're thinking, oh, you know what? Yeah, two weeks ago, right. We were talking about this. I'm starting to see it. Because once people get that mental shift, they start to recognize the opportunities to apply it 
opportunities to learn from what their coworkers do and say, oh, I see what she's doing. Yeah, that's just like what we were talking about. Okay, I can learn from that. And then as an added bonus, of course, by creating these diverse teams, you also increase employee engagement because not only are they feeling that they're learning and developing more through your company, but you're increasing that internal network yeah. and that cross department communication. So you get these massive benefits. So the way to, to teach and develop this, it is through discussion, through case studies, through peer learning, and you get all these great secondary benefits. Mm -hmm. Would you also recommend bringing into that conversation future leaders? like leaders that you feel like are on that career path that aren't maybe a director or a leader, et cetera, but you want to bring them in as, as, as training, or do you think that adds a different, it doesn't add much to the picture? Oh, it very much does. This, what I just described is not just for your leadership team. Oh, okay. Your people. This is for everyone. For everyone. Okay. Okay. This is taking some junior person two years out of university who's just saying, you know, I'm here I don't even know the questions to ask. <laughs> I don't even know what it means to be a leader or what questions I should ask or what the path is to become one because we haven't trained people to ask these questions. Put them in this conversation because after a few of them, they're going to start to say, huh, you know, I really discovered there's a lot more to leadership than I thought. What do I, what do, I do in addition to these discussions? And they're going to go and take courses or books or start to get other ideas. I'm not bashing that content. That's great. But it's going to supplement and be a catalyst for these discussions that they have. Mm, absolutely love that. And it's super practical. There's so many benefits, not just obviously, as you mentioned, the engagement, the bringing people from different cross-function, the different functions together that perhaps wouldn't normally interact so that also then sparks innovation because they you know communicating with each other and problem solving there's just so much <laughs> going on and going on in that and it uh, doesn't cost anything <laughs> right. think, think about it from a cost perspective you normally when you lead hr you say to your cfo by the way i need ten thousand dollars okay what are you going to do with it well i'm going to pick 10 lucky winners and we're going to spend a thousand dollars each to go send them to some leadership training course or yeah. whatever the the courses. All you're doing is asking for money to go spend on a vendor. You in HR don't feel like you're adding a lot of direct value. If you create this type of program within your company, now you probably will spend some money because you might bring in a speaker that then everyone just learns the content, discusses in a small group. Maybe you do buy everyone a book, right? You get them some content, but now that $10,000, if you're looking at say a $20 book, you're getting 500 people the book and not 10 people the course. So your dollars are going to go much further and you're going to go from just being, well, I'm picking vendors to I am creating a training course that's going to increase capability and engagement among a wide set of our employees. Mm -hmm. This is a clear win for everyone. Yeah, I agree. One of the big challenges, especially over the last 12 months, has been communication. Um, especially because we're not face to face, we're not having in person meetings, we're all remote now. It's also created a very different dynamic when you've got 20, 30 people on a Zoom call, you have certain personalities that dominate. Um, you know, there's so much <laughs> going, going on. Um, could, can you, in the book, you talk about mental models that people have could you could you explain that first and we can start there and then we can talk about some more of the examples you give around how to best communicate this is what i alluded to a little earlier there's multiple versions of mental models but i'm, I'm going to do just one basic example i was first trained as a physicist so i think of everything like a physicist now a physicist what do we do we think of, okay, here you have um, you know, a cow rolling down a hill. So what do we do? We say, well, first treat the cow as a sphere, right? Because we can model all the legs flowing everywhere. And this is a standard type of problem that you get in physics. You know, just treat the cow as a sphere. You know, cow weighs 2000 pounds, call it a sphere, pretend there's no friction here, right? We're gonna simplify it, right? We're gonna say what's important. The weight of the cow is important. Is there friction or not? color of the cow certainly doesn't matter, right? Other things don't matter. Time of day doesn't matter. Just picture now a sphere going down the hill. What are the forces? Calculate. Okay, great. That's how I think of the world. I look and say, what are the relevant forces? What's irrelevant when I create my model? 
if there was an artist looking at this, the artist can say, no, cow's not a sphere. Maybe if they were a, um, you know, in the family of Pablo Picasso, then, then a cow might be a sphere. Probably. <laughs> we're going to say, you know, let's look at the cow and what's the essence of the cow and is it day or night and what does the scene look like? Right, they're going to view this very differently because they're not thinking about what are the different forces acting on the cow. They're going to look at the problem differently. And so all of us, in terms of how we're trained, look at things differently. Lawyers are inherently trained to think about what is the risk and liability? Hey, is that cow going to roll down the hill and hit someone? Because there could be a lawsuit, right? That's the first thing a lawyer is going to think. A physicist, we're not thinking that. We're thinking about what's the terminal velocity when the cow's at the bottom of the hill. And so all of us, by our training, by our experience, look at problems differently. And recognizing that is important because first that brings in that diversity of how we're going to approach problems. I go into a lot more detail in the book with examples of this, but then also it means if I'm talking to you about the speed of the cow and you're saying, I don't care about the speed, I just care, is someone going to get hit? Because when I go to a trial jury, yeah, faster probably does more damage, but all the all people are kind of hear in the jury is your cow hit some little child and oh, that's going to be a massive lawsuit. Mm -hmm. So recognizing these different backgrounds help us understand how we all perceive challenges and opportunities before us. Yeah. Well, then that being said, and I'm glad you set the scene. The reason I asked that is you now have the leaders that I work with that are listening to this show having to communicate to thousands of employees all over the world, all of different mental models, but they're trying to convey a message via email, whatever it may be, but then they have to consider all of these mental models and, and how this message is going to come across to that individual, depending on how they think about these things. You know, what advice would you give to them? Because now a lot of uh, PR and com, uh, a lot of HR leaders that I, and leaders in general have all of a sudden become PR and communications experts <laughs> during the last 12 months, constantly having to write up, uh, uh, write, write, write content. And uh, this is going to be a big challenge. This is a challenge that politicians have faced for years, right? Because a politician has to go out. Please everyone. <laughs> country. Yeah. What's that? Trying to please everyone. Yeah, or at least communicate and reach everyone. Yeah, reach everyone. Yeah, okay. Yeah. And make sure everyone understands the ideas. And if you look at how some of the great presidential speeches have been, you'll see a diversity in how they approach the problems. You'll see they approach it different ways. And I break this down in the book to show how they can do the, the different parts of it. You have to do some of this, especially when you're leading a large corporation. And so there's actually two steps within a corporation. So one is you create this generic kind of big version that resonates a little bit in each of those different models. But then you also want to make sure within your uh, departments that you as the CEO or you as the HR leader have communicated what it's going to mean to each department. In fact, in the management chapter, I talk about one of the aspects of being a manager, certainly a senior level manager, is being a translator. As a CTO, part of my job is that I need to take complex technical issues. Here's a trade-off that we might do choosing different databases. Well, I can't explain the subtleties of the databases to the people in the other departments. They, they don't understand that and they're not gonna have time to really dig into it. I have to put that into non-technical terms and explain, here's the trade-off. Here's what we're trying to decide. Here's what this means financially. Here's what this means in terms of legal risk. Here's what this means in terms of marketing opportunity. And when they make decisions about this or anything else, I have to go back and say to my technical team, okay, here's the direction of the company. Here's what we decided. This is what it means for us. This is what it means we as engineers or product or data science people have to do to support that. And so your senior leaders need to learn how to translate effectively between their domain and others. And certainly at the top, when we convey an idea, we want to make sure we help that translation by saying, this is what it's going to mean to each of you. Probably not in that broad communication. But yeah. On one. So kind of the, 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 the top, kind of broader, kind of touching upon every one of those personality types, uh, mental models. And as we work our way down, we're getting more and more specific, more niche and more targeted to make sure that every department function understands what this means for you 
and, and what you're contributing to that overall picture. So there's no easy way around it, really. We have to create multiple, multiple communication pieces depending on our target audience. If you want to communicate effectively, right? And it's a, it's a trade-off. At a certain point, you might say, you know, it's not worth doing time. another, another <laughs> yeah. level because I have other things to worry about. But you at least want to be conscious of this trade-off and say, is it worth going one level down or two level down or not? Yeah, because no, I can't I can't tell you the amount of times I've heard those kind of overall communication pieces and thought, well, what does that even mean for me? And what about personal brand? How can someone build their personal brand? We've seen over the last few years the importance of building a personal brand. We're seeing many CEOs and leaders now um, pay very close attention to their brand. And we know this can impact companies share price uh you know it's just it's, you know whether it be you know elon musk going on the joe rogan podcast and smoking some weed and all of a sudden costing the company <laughs> millions um it, it's, it's an interesting uh, especially with social media now it's we're always on yes and certainly if you're thinking about how do we help our senior executives develop their personal brand my book is not the book for you. There are some great books, Dory Clark's uh, Reinventing You. There are some really good books that get into this. I really focus on personal brand for all of us, for the low-level employee, the mid-level employee, not just the executives. Because if you are a senior whatever, but as an individual contributor and you want to get to that next level, you have to be seen as being capable at that level. And so for all of us, it's recognizing, okay, for what I want to achieve, right, getting this promotion, moving to this other department, being on this project, I need to be perceived as having the capabilities that will make me successful in that role. And so there are some starting basic techniques like asking people, this actually comes from Dory Clark, asking people, what three words would you use to describe me? Right? Just give me three adjectives. Oh, okay, that, that's great, that's helpful. And so you start to recognize, are people seeing me the way I want to be seen for this role? I give an example uh, from my own career. Early on, I was applying to a job. I think it was like a senior architect or a, a VP of engineering job. And so I'm down, uh, in, I'm down at the company site. We're waiting for the meetings to start. I'm in the break room. It's around lunchtime. People are coming in and we're just chatting. We were having a talk about company culture. And a woman came in and sat there and we're, she was listening to the conversation. After about 10 minutes, she said, so I'm curious, do you have any technical skills or are you just a business guy? Because I'm there in my suit and we're talking company culture. And so I politely said, well, I do have a couple computer science degrees from MIT. I said, oh, and that was it. It was like I slammed her and it wasn't my type, but she just heard MIT, boom, mic drop, right? You don't think, oh, MIT guy, is he technical? Will this math be too hard for him? Right? Just go, That's true. That's, That's true. my brand. The challenge I've always had is people have said, well, Mark, you're an MIT guy. Do you understand finance? Do you understand strategy, people skills? They don't teach that at MIT. Actually, you don't teach it in a lot of places. But I've had to convey that I understand this. I've had to change my personal brand because while I was fine for technical, no one's ever wondered if I understood that part, they've wondered about the others. And for all of us, we're all perceived in certain ways. And it could be from how we dress, the words we use, it could be our prior experience, our degrees, our job titles. It conveys something about us and we have to be conscious of it. And again, this is not just for senior engineers or sorry, senior leaders, it's for people all levels saying, even within the company to get to where I wanna go, what is my brand and how will that help me? Or certainly if you're looking to go to another company, again, do you have a brand that's going to help or hurt you? So we should help everyone develop their personal brand up and down the hierarchy. Um, I want to ask a question, which is an interesting thing that I noticed in the book. In the book that you claim that someone can make $30,000 <laughs> with your advice, uh, which is a pretty bold, bold claim. <laughs> Why did you include that in the book and how can they do this? Sure. I, I included that. I know it feels a little gimmicky, but I, I have some marketing background and I'm like, all right, I need a marketing. <laughs> yeah. Here, here's how to do it. And 
at first, HR people are going to hear this and say, oh, my God, this is terrible. <laughs> then I'm going to explain how this will benefit you as well from an employee's perspective. So imagine you're an employee and you go and you're 30 years old and you go out and you get a job and they give you an offer for $80,000. Okay, not bad. But you've learned to negotiate. Again, not being the world's greatest negotiator, you've just learned some basic negotiation skills and you go in and you negotiate for a thousand dollars more. So you say, instead of 80, let's do 81,000. Okay, that's not a huge lift. So you get 81,000. You now work in that job for the next 30 years. You never take another job. What just happened? In that one little negotiation, you earned a thousand dollars more for 30 years. In five minutes, you just got $30,000 more. That's all it takes. Mm -hmm. Now, of course, we know that's unrealistic. No one sits in a job for 30 years anymore. You're going to probably take other jobs or at the very least get raises, get promotions. So in fact, it's going to be more than once that you do this. And of course, $1,000, that's pretty small. You can imagine getting even bigger increases. Learning to negotiate, you as an individual are going to be adding tens of thousands, most likely hundreds of thousands of dollars in lifetime earning. And we're just talking about salary. In fact, we know negotiations, it's not first, not just about salary, it's about other things, but it's not even just about compensation because we negotiate all the time and not just the obvious ones like with vendors and suppliers and customers, but even internally, we negotiate with our peers as we're doing projects. Learning to be a better negotiator makes you so much more effective. And in fact, this line of, of reasoning, it applies to being a better leader, a better communicator, a better interviewer, but it's not as clear that, oh, you're a little better leader. Okay, here's a thousand dollars more a year. It's not so direct, that's more indirect. Being a better leader, you get more opportunities and therefore more promotions and better jobs in the future. Mm -hmm. Now, HR people, so there's a lot of people listening going, oh, wait, if I let my employees get better, imagine if each of my employees suddenly got $1,000 more, right? This is real money. It's going to cost me. And that's true to a first order. But when you understand how negotiations work, salaries are uh, unfortunately a bad example. Now, I use it because it sells the point, but it is a fixed sum, right? Every $1,000 more you give someone, $1,000 less for you. Good negotiators know negotiating is not just about dividing the pie, it's about expanding the pie. And so what you wanna do is expand the pie as big as possible, and then of course, claim as big a piece as you can for yourself. So imagine you train up your entire staff to be better negotiators. And so imagine all of them are now getting one to $2,000 more per year. Okay, that's a certain amount of money. But if they are all better negotiators, that is going to improve how you do, again, with your customers, your partners, your suppliers. It's going to improve how they engage with each other to be more effective and find better solutions internally as you work on projects and problems and opportunities. So yes, you're gonna show out more money, but with a team of people who are much better negotiators, you're gonna generate so much more value, you will gladly give them a slightly bigger piece because the pie overall is gonna be so much bigger. But for anyone listening, if, if there's like one parting piece of advice you give to everyone, what would that be? And then where can they connect with you to learn more, grab a coffee of the book and, and get in touch? Sure, I'm going to combine the two. You can go learn more about the book at thecareertoolkitbook.com. And of course, you can buy it at Amazon, Barnes & Noble, um, local bookstores. So lots of places to get it. And you can see that from the website. You can also get in touch with me through the website. The piece of advice I would give is to create these peer learning groups because they're going to add so much value to your company. They're going to train up people at low cost, increase employee engagement. They're going to also give you a common language because when people have been communicating using the same resources, you can now all say, oh, it's just like the physicist versus a lawyer example. And so that's made things more efficient. Now on my website, there's a resources page where I list a whole bunch of other great books. There's also a lot of free downloads, including how to create such a program. It is free to download. Yes, you can use my book for this and I show how you can chop up the book, but you don't just have to use my book. You can not use my book at all. You can use any of the other great books. You can use podcasts like this. You can use any source of content 
And you can download this, say, okay, I'm going to create a program, put my own content in it, and now go to your teams and say, I came up with a really great program to train up our employees. <laughs> you can take all the credit. Yeah. Right? You cross out my name, put yours in. I'm quite happy for you to do that. And generate this program that's going to really benefit your employees and your company. And all this is on the website, thecareertoolkitbook.com. There's also an app. It's a free app. And it takes a lot of the content from the book because, again, a challenge. You read a book like this, you go, oh, it's really interesting. And you forget it three weeks later. And from my teaching, I know that spaced repetition works. So each day, it's like a daily affirmation. It just pops up on your phone. Go right, oh, that was a tip about why we should ask this type of interview question. Swipe it away. So it's really no effort. You don't have to open the app. But then it's also, if you're about to go to, say, a networking event, you can open it up and do a quick refresher on it using the app. Also free, also available. Amazing. From the website and in the uh, Android and iPhone stores. Cool. Well, I'll make sure for everyone listening that all of those links are already below to make your life easier. But thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show. And if you are grabbing a copy of your book, you sold out the first entire run. So <laughs> you may have to wait a little bit, but it'd be worth it. But that uh, that's already saying something that you've sold out the first entire run on Amazon. So there'll be more books coming soon, but make sure you download the app, head over to the website, get the resources there as well. But thanks so much for taking the time to come on the show. It's been a pleasure and um, I look forward to chatting again soon. Okay. Thanks for having me. I've really enjoyed it.